welcome to Pleasure Container with Gem and Jess. We are two best friends on a healing journey. Over our two decades of friendship, we have created a safe space to process our heartbreaking confusion of growing up in a harm-filled world while transforming these feelings into lessons we receive joy from. Our friendship has been a pillar in our healing journeys and ultimately is a gift we want to share with the world. Hi, I'm Jem, a self-love coach, escort, doula trainer, and singer. That's me in the theme song. Hey! Get comfy, roll up a joint, nourish your body, and unwind with us as we share our unfiltered process, wiggling our way through this goof nugget called life. Remember, shame is a tool of the oppressor, community heals, and pleasure shows the way. Okay, so Jesse has a Louise Hay deck of cards, of Oracle cards, and she's doing a reading for me. Yeah, well, I'm doing a reading for us, for this moment. Okay, for this moment. Okay. Or it could be for you. Do you want one specifically for you? No, no, I love, I love it being for us in this moment. That feels great. We can do one for you later, too. Um, I just had something that I was thinking that fled my mind, but, um, whatever. So the topic of, we wanted to talk about celebration and joy. And last week we didn't get to, um, record because there was so much transition happening for me that I woke up and called you from my bed, like, can't can't do today need to be naky poo poo and talk to you as my best friend and not on a podcast yes. <laughs> and it was so wonderful and squishy and divine and um, I would have been afraid to say it but I needed a break too I honestly was like pushing it I get into this pushy energy with work where I start to force stuff and like I forget to just take the breaks where I need them and I, I definitely needed that break it was a divine break I'm, I'm so glad it happened but I would have been I wouldn't have been able to ask for it so thank you thank you for taking it for us Aww. well that's something that we can just like work on too because yeah that's totally allowable to ask for breaks yeah. Our life yeah. is so fast. It's so unnaturally fast. Like our bodies have not caught up. Our nervous system specifically have not caught up with the demands of the life that we're living. It's so true. Even like the awkwardness for me of starting this episode and needing you to mommy that had something to do with this pressure to like pack every moment with some kind of value or like content or production. And it's like, that's not really the energy of what this space is about at all. It's actually a space for people to come and pause. And I would really love it to be that. And I, I feel really passionate about not editing out the quiet and allowing it to be at the actual tempo of life. Because I'll even listen to, when I'm listening to um, like videos from my coaching course with Julia Wells, I'll listen to them on one and a half speed. And I'll straight up just like, like, you know, stick my fingers in the matrix and like, zzz, like suck the like ultra fast information because as Gemini, like we can operate on that, but it's not what, it's not what my body wants. It's not what my body needs. It's oh, really not. Interesting. Interesting. It's actually one of my biggest signs um, that I'm like doing too much. It's one of my like yellow zone nervous system activation points where I'm like, oh, this is a yellow zone. I need to scale back and get into pleasure. Otherwise, I'm going to go into red and I'm going to get fully activated. I know it's a it's like a trigger point that I recognize when I'm wanting to listen to my friend's voice messages on one and a half speed. Mm. Then I know something is off. The balance is off. The tempo is off and I'm in a yellow like I'm I'm verging on activation if that's happening. 
It's so great that you're able to pinpoint so definitively what are your zones. Like that's so clear and concise. If I listen on 1.5, alert, alert, alert. I have the same thing where when I start feeling like needy in like a relationship or something, I kind of, I'll start wanting to, because this is so embarrassing to share, you know this about me, but when I was younger, if I felt I needed attention, I was really used to receiving attention through the form of sympathy. So I felt like I needed something like wrong to be happening in my life to like earn attention. So I would, my brain would kind of conjure up these lies and these stories that would be like, oh yeah, if I tell someone this, I'm definitely going to get attention. And this, this actually led to like a big blowout for me, life changing blowout, come to God moment where I realized I had to like start telling the truth and couldn't speak lies. But even now, sometimes I'll get a thought where like, oh, I want this. It doesn't really come in the thought of me thinking a lie anymore, but it does come in the expression of me like getting this feeling of someone, of wanting someone to feel sympathy for me. And that's my yellow zone. I'm like, okay, yellow zone, yellow zone, reel it in. Go give yourself some good gushy love in whatever form you are. Your yellow zone, yellow zone. <laughs> oh, I love hearing you bring awareness to that. And I just want to take like a little bit of like a gentle massage in the moment where you said that that's an embarrassing thing. Because I know that it's like easy to feel that way about it. But I just want to like reflect for you as your friend that when I think about you and those times and the things we went through, you were A, a child, and B, there's a, it's a, it's a response to your conditioning and it's a response to what was around you that that was the best, most effective method you knew to get attention. And again, because you were a child, that makes me think more to what was going on around you and not so much about like you. I, I don't see it as a character flaw in you. It makes me sad for what you experienced that like that was how you got attended to, you know, when you were growing up. I have a lot of compassion for that having been your like coping mechanism. Thank you. And that does feel good to have that massage because this is a place where we're trying not to be shameful mm -hmm. and even yesterday as I was watching I don't know why I just said watching I was truly watching Gilmore Girls wonderful, balanced writer doing his life. And it made me think of all the kids that grew up in really shaky conditions and how, how it is the environment. And when you're a kid, you can't control that environment. So if you're just subject to a lot of crap, you know, as, as a young adult and as a teenager, that's a lot of stuff to lead through. So mm -hmm. thank you for um, Again, massaging that little point because there there is some shame there that I still work through just the ways that I handle things and I know I that totally I was a understand. kid but you were a kid I know I know you were a child who needed love and attention and belonging that is the most essential thing for human survival more than water more than air more than food more than anything, even touch, I would say, is a sense of a, a being attended to, a sense of love and belonging that is our safety because we do not have enough resources to care for ourselves. If we wanted to go out and buy food or buy our own dinner, we can't. We literally can't. We are dependent on our caregivers for everything. And if that is the way we get things, then we got to get our things. We need it. It is survival. It is life or death. And we, we need what we need. You're right. You're right. And I think actually touch might even fall within that category of like uh, basic human needs. Like a baby, you know, they, they will die if you don't touch them too long enough. They will. Yes. yes. And as adults, I think we die without touch as well, but we die slower. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't think we need it because we're regulated. We're full blown adults with like disagree that can now operate in this world. But like our hearts disagree. We need it. We need it. we need it for warmth. We need it for we are social creatures. Even if you tend to be a little bit more of a lone wolf type person. I mean, I am that type of person. I still need my people. I need, you know, I need my core people. I need to know what's going on in their lives and feel that connection from day to day. Otherwise, I don't feel alive. All of it kind of seems like, what is the point? Yeah, one of my favorite Clementine Morgan um, teachings is that... uh, we're really obsessed with the kind of cowboy ideology of somebody who just takes care of themselves. And people talk about self-care as though like we should all just be self-regulated and that it's like this obligation and we should feel shame if we're not. And she's always like out there preaching that it's, and she was the first person that even introduced me to this concept, even though it was right there in front of my face as a doula all the time, like counseling people through, oh, when you hold your baby, it regulates their temperature, it regulates their heart rate, it regulates their hormones, regulates their emotion, it regulates their breathing even, and reminds them to keep breathing because their nervous system isn't fully developed yet. Like I was spouting that, but not getting that like there is no hierarchy between self-regulation and co-regulation. We need co-regulation just as much. And so we should never feel shame about needing to cuddle someone else or just being in a state where like we can't regulate ourselves and we just need someone else there. Like even just starting this podcast, I needed you to start the podcast. I was literally like, like I couldn't. And that is valid. You know what I mean? I think like just erasing shame from that is really a beautiful thing in and of itself. Well said. But yeah, I guess like in terms of like breaking taboo and breaking shame, what is under my butt right now? <laughs> what is that? Is that a merry treat? What is that? I don't know. I think it's a knob maybe from the ring light. You know, my butt, it has this thing where it just swallows objects. And like every time I lose an object, it could be a pen. It could be an entire phone. It could be a puzzle piece, a board game piece. It's like, I know that I will not find it until I fully stand up because you can dig and dig and dig under this rock and you will never find a thing. It is a treasure, treasure trove. It is the cave of magical objects and you won't, you really won't find <laughs> doing readings from my enlightened birth affirmation deck um about the birth of the um sex work launch and it kept pulling the card over and over and over for me it always kept giving me the card that says like my body is magic and it grew life it's like one of the like birthing affirmations and it just says really big my body is magic my body is magic my body is magic and i think that's what they were talking about is that that capacity to hold mystery within one's ass you know also, your body is pure magic. What a beautiful card to be reading for that experience because not only are we looking at your body from like the physical manifestation, juicy, sexy, oh my God, divine, let me lick it, let me squish it, let me eat it, let me smack it. <laughs> then there's also the aspect of like you were just kind of saying, all the magical abilities that are held within your body. You're a person that has found so many tools for transforming energy, which is basically, I feel like what we're doing here on earth. You know, we're given energy, we're given choices, and we figure out how to transform it and what will work best for us. You're such a master at transforming energy, sharing light, giving to others. Like your body is magic. And for you to be holding that and remembering that as you walk into this business, makes a lot of sense for me that you would draw that card on repeat. 
Thank you so much for seeing that. Yeah, I guess they were giving it to me multiple times because it took a while for the lesson to fully sink in. But that I was, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'll speak up, but I was like laying in my hammock uh, the other day and just closing my eyes. And just, I like to like use the hammock to stretch in. Like I like to like lie in it and wear different unconventional positions and face down with my like legs out and froggy. And like, I basically like to use the hammock as like an autistic, like physical access tool. Yeah. Yeah. It feels so good. Yeah. And I closed my eyes while I was just in some kind of like open body stretch and I felt my energy and I could almost see it. And it was really sparkle based and it was like rainbowish kind of pink and blue and purplish and yellow and gold and white and silver, whatever, like green sparkles that were just like raining down and I got to see it in like a waterfall pattern and I did have that thought to myself I was like damn if this is my energy then this is what I'm getting paid for straight up is that it's not even like people are so obsessed with this idea of sex work as the exchange of sex sex for money and like Mm -hmm. some of it comes down to that but I I'm not guessing when people have reached out to me with inquiries, they've said that like, oh, there's something about you or your photos or something. I felt like I could trust you or I felt like I, you know, was still thinking about it's, it's an energetic response people are having. They're just not like always able to put a name to that. Definitely. I was talking with my friend the other day about how um, people pay, like there was this one guy that she knew of that paid this person so much money to walk through the forest littering. That was his, that's what turned him on. Turned me off immediately because I was like, oh my God, littering in the forest and the terrace. That's disgusting. I hope somebody's coming behind and cleaning it up. I hope so too. I have no idea. I have no idea. But the point of this is that people are attracted to things that we think, especially we've been conditioned, I feel like, to think sexuality is, it's the body, it's the Kardashian look, it's the full lips, Mm -hmm. it's what you look like. But sexuality is so much deeper than that. It's desire. And people have really fruitful, creative desires. So yeah, Mm -hmm. it's not, it's, yeah, sure, there's some of this and like cute or pretty or whatever. But people are going towards what they're attracted to, which is so much deeper than the physical appearance. It's so true. It's so true. Something must have, oh, no, I'm not going to be judgmental about that person's desire. I'm going to trust that there were adults that were taking care of that situation. Because if I start to think about the littering too deeply, I will feel ill. But um, yeah, I did almost want to circle back to the, the shame and like, lying and attention thing because I just wanted to like meet you where you were at with your share and share something that's incredibly vulnerable that I've never told anyone oh my gosh but like but I can like I can hold it it's so in context with everything but it was like um one of the thoughts one of the many complicated thoughts that I experienced when I was 13 and my dad died yeah so many different complicated thoughts and emotions like (laughs) really a lot of layers there. I mean, in some ways I felt really, really relieved. I would actually say my primary emotion was relief um, because our relationship had been so painful and painful in ways I didn't like know how to articulate or know how to ask for support around. And it was just so heavy on me. And, you know, he would call every day, like every day usually. And when the phone would ring, even if it wasn't him, immediate nervous system trigger, 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 alert, alert, alert response. And so I'm basically sitting in my home. Wow. It's amazing how doula work mirrored that. Okay. That's a whole other thing. It is amazing how we just keep repeating patterns until we choose to be aware of them and step outside. Like we can't even stop it. They are on repeat. It is happening. Unbelievable. That's Wow. I'm glad I had that insight. I'm glad I'm sharing this. This is like what vulnerable shares are about. Yeah. But I, um, yeah, I was sitting in my house every day feeling like, oh, the phone is going to ring. And then I'm going to have to have this really difficult conversation with my parent who was inebriated and like telling me the same stories over and over and like telling me things that are like too heavy for me to hear. And like, you know, just all of that, like uh, knowing that 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 was the least of it. 
that was the least of it. But if even that was something that I wasn't going to have to experience again, I did feel relieved and it's understandable to feel relieved. But then, and on top of the relief, I felt so much guilt, so much guilt for feeling that way. And so I was just choked. Like my grief for him lived in my throat chakra. A lot of the time, it was like a really tight squeeze on my throat because how can I express something that is something I feel so guilty about? And yet it's my primary emotion around it. And then, yeah, I think it's just also really reasonable. And I love taking this taboo out of death. I did think like, okay, well, so I'm 13 and I have a parent who has died. So pretty much all of my life, people will feel some type of way about that. Like I will get some kind of energetic response to the fact that this is like part of my life path that was like gratifying for me and essentially was attention. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like I was like, oh, wow, this is really, this is really like something that I get. It's like a card that I get to play. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I totally get what you're saying by that. Yeah. And also felt so much guilt and shame around that. But then it's also like, yeah, sympathy is a part of death. It's like a function of death. And we're allowed to, I think, live a lot of complication around it that people don't like to talk about. Imagine like how stilted and like pained and crunched so many conversations are around funerals in the States. Like... What are we saying and not saying? I really, really feel that we need to get back to collective ritual. Yeah. Where we're really communing. I read something the other day that was like, you know, when you're saying all these nice things at a funeral, why are you saving them until the funeral? Why are you, why are you waiting until the end when they're not even around to hear it? Say it when they're alive. So true. I think about that all the time. And I I think you and I both do a really good job of that, of just saying it. I think we do. I think we do a really good job. Do you want to celebrate? I remember when, um, actually the first feeling that you had expressed to me around the passing of your dad was, well, you wrote a letter, actually. You didn't tell us in words. You didn't know how to do it. I'm a letter writer. I always have been. You wrote one letter and you had us send it to each other. It was me, Jenny, Lauren, and I think Nadia. Was that the gang of people that I think it was you and Lauren and Jenny. Me, Lauren, and Jenny. Yeah. And then I remember, I remember the shame that you felt over that. And it's funny looking back now as adults, how much sense that makes. And when you're a child, you can't deal with complex emotions that well. You can't say, okay, I love this person and all these things made me feel this way. But as an adult, you can look back and hold the complexity of all of it and say, I really cherish this person and these things happened that were incredibly hard for me to hold at a young age. Right. I mean, what you should understand about the letter writing is, first of all, camp we write letters. Like it's, I feel it's like a, a spiritual practice to write a letter, but also my throat was so constricted by so much heart wrenching fuckery that like the amount of being torn apart on the inside was beyond, I could not have spoken it. I tried to think about how could I even begin to have this conversation? And I did not have the spoons. I literally did not have the energy to have it. Not even once, not multiple times. So it was a gift that I could like trust you guys that if I did pass on that information to one of you, that you guys could take a little of the emotional labor of sharing that and holding that. Cause I I just couldn't, I couldn't hold it. I had to tell Maisie. I had to tell Angie. I had to tell Jenny. I had to tell, Um, like so many people, so many people, like, and then my teachers also knew and they were asking me questions about it. And then other people would sort of get wind and walk up and is someone saying your dad died? Is that true? And I had to have the conversation so much and I just couldn't pick up the phone and then start a whole new round of like, I literally could not, if I could have, I would have. Oh, I know. I thought it was a really beautiful way to tell us because 
I mean, over the phone, you can only hear it once, but I was able to read that letter over and over again and try to digest what was going on with you. <sighs> it's such a difficult time. Yeah, and today being we... a parent as a, as a young child is really a difficult experience. It's difficult. I don't know a single person that has gone through the experience unscathed and not just like traumatized from all the shit that ensues after it happens. And then we grow up and we're okay, but we look back and we're like, wow, that was fucking rough. <laughs> that was that was the shit, man. That was the shit. It did also make me feel a little strong though. I remember feeling younger and feeling a little bit strong, being like, okay, I'm kind of out here, like, doing my own laundry, like, feeding myself my own dinners, like, supporting my dad emotionally, like, I got this. <laughs> but You know, this is, I think, a really good segue into our conversation around receiving. And, like, how much... <laughs> Last night, I had to tell me. It was so weird. It was so weird. Okay, I'm just gonna kick off this little conversation with receiver. I'm gonna tell you a story about last night. So, just to preface this story, Casper's harness has been missing for like a week, and just I don't yesterday. Know. I decided that it was gone and I wasn't going to find it again. And so I'm on my way to teach yoga and I have the thought, wow, I haven't had any regular students in a while. And then my next thought is, I also haven't had a small class in a while. Then I'm thoughtless again, driving on my way. <laughs> I'm thoughtless again. It's my favorite. And so I get there, and what do I have? I have one repeat student who is so excited to be there for that class. Aww. Like, so receptive. And then I have one more student, so it's a small class, two students, and then another student who is very sweet, but is for example, I said we're going to use foam blocks for this class. This student pulled out the wood blocks. She's like, I'm going to try this with the wood blocks. This is restorative. There are poses where we lay flat on our backs and just support our bodies with like a block under the sacrum. Now with the wood block, this is going to cut into your like, skin and like your sacrum's like going to be like, whoa. <laughs> like, anyways. Point of the story is, so I had two students, small class, and one of them was a repeat student. And there's a point in class, and you've been in my classes, where I, I usually tend to talk about gratitude, but sometimes I'll feel pulled to talk about something different, and it happens right in the moment, and it's usually after I've like made a connection with a student, and I don't even know what I'm saying until I'm looking at the student and I realize this, you are why I'm saying this. Channeling, then, baby. So yesterday, I started talking about receptivity. I mm -hmm. started talking about how we're allowed to be reborn at every moment. How we can become so identified with what we're doing and who we're doing it with and our daily routines that we can feel confined to be one kind of person. But in the truth of it, we're free to be whoever we want. If we're just receptive to what flow is trying to bring through us, we end up rebirthing ourselves many times if we're open to this receptive state. So I was talking about that, and I myself in the past few days have had a huge lesson around learning how to receive. Receiving is very difficult for me. So I'm teaching and I did notice at one point like this one student that was not as receptive that was like getting wood blocks for things and just I started giving them more attention because uh. I was worried about their experience 
and I knew student over here was having the time of their lives. They were juicy, they were they were juicy, they were loving all of it. And I ended up putting my attention, I became attached to the experience that the students were having. I took myself out of receptivity state and started trying to make the experience better for this one student or not even trying to make the experience better. I was treating her like a normal student, but I was worried in my head. I was so worried about what her experience was like. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I realized it was like this really kind of full circle thing where I felt, and this happens a lot in yoga, which is what I really love when you teach big classes, especially not that this was a big class, this was a small class, but um, you end up being taught by the students by the things that they bring into the room and the things that you end up teaching on, you end up learning from as well. So I'm sitting here realizing at the very end of class, they're both in Shavasana laying there like little babies. And I'm like, I was not being receptive to the receptivity of this other student. Like it was a very half glass half full, glass half empty situation where I had one student completely in the sauce, ready to go, looking at me with eyes like this, saying, this is the best part of my day. I will be back next week. I am here for your energy. You look beautiful up there doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I chose to harden myself to that because it was harder to receive that pure, pure, juicy love than to look at something and think I can fix this. Yes! It's so tempting. So tempting. So next time, if I'm in a situation like that, I just, I'm going to lean into where the receptivity is and it will be hard for me. I've now seen that that is not something that I would patternistically do, but I, I feel that that is the healthiest and most evolutionary growthful choice. So I'm repeating, I'm like receiving the lesson. I'm walking home. Actually, I was going to the person whose house I'm dating. Person <laughs> who I'm dating house. I'm not dating house. <laughs> <laughs> You're dating his house. I want you to date his house. Okay, sorry, continue. <laughs> he might sell his house. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm walking and I'm repeating in my head because of this. I'm like, I'm receiving. I'm like really trying to let it fall into my body. And I'm thinking of you at times when I, when you will stop and you'll say, I am receiving this. I am receiving this. I was really just trying to work myself into this receptive state. So I'm saying, I am receiving, I am receiving. And I look up and there's Casper's harness hanging on a fence, just like a fence right outside of where I parked my car outside of, outside of his house. And I'm like, oh my God, his heart is for a week. Great. So I grab it and I keep walking. I'm like, I am receiving. I am receiving. <laughs> I look down on the ground and there's my favorite hair clip. That I <laughs> Jesse, do you need to know that like the universe's love language with Jesse, probably primary love language <laughs> love language with Jesse and way of expressing its love towards her and her life is by leaving shit on the street for her to find. It is like it is the pattern. It is the her entire home. Her entire home, including the bed and mattress, the bed frame and mattress, are all gifts that the street gave her. She literally walked out of her house once on the day that she had no bed. The day she had no bed, and her neighbor was pulling a, a, a fresh bed out of their home at the same time. Like, this is brand new. This is beautiful. We can't use it. Like, everything. Yeah. Everything you see behind her, street. 
Yeah, I get it. I'm a street gal. I'm a street gal. The streets provide for me. I street shoes. <laughs> street shoes. I have my favorite pair of shoes. Adidas from the street. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch. Okay. Am I interrupting you after the fuzzy hair clip? No, that was pretty much the end of the story. I did. I noticed that in a state of receptivity, and one of the reasons that I might be a little bit adverse sometimes to it is because it is so outside of my comfort zone, and this ties in with abundance and celebration and joy, that it can make me manic. So after I received my harness, after I received my hair clip, after I had had this, what felt like a wild journey to me inside of the yoga class, which, oh, I also fucked up in the yoga class. I went to some other place. We were doing sun salutations and in the middle of down dog, I space astronauted. I don't know where I went. I went somewhere else that was not in that room. All of a sudden I came to again and I found my body in down dog and I was like, fuck, what do I instruct next? Exhale or inhale? Like, where are we? What am I doing? Like, I was gone. I was totally disassociated. That's and fine. You're welcome. You're fine. You. You're perfect. You're glorious. But I also, once I came to, I then instructed the wrong thing. Like we had exhaled into chaturanga and then I instructed to exhale again. And I realized in hindsight, I did it wrong. You know what the thing is, though? Didn't fucking matter to the student no. that was here for my energy for the things I was teaching. They could give a shit. They came out of that class and said, oh, my God, that was just so wonderful. Thank you. And I'm just realizing as we're talking about your energy and seeing your energy and expressing your new business and, like, people will come for your energy. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be ourselves and receptive. But back to what I was talking about a little bit. Yeah, it does make me a little bit manic because when I'm really in that receptive state and I'm open to all the gifts that are around me, they're so ever present and so clear and coming at such full speed that I feel manic sometimes. Yes, I hear you 1000%. I can definitely empathize. Um, when I was in, and I, I wrote an email to this about my email list, but like, I feel like this is the kind of thing that I'm going to end up like repeating like many times in my career. Cause like, this is yeah. something that people need to hear and understand. But like, when I was in my name change ceremony, which like for the audience listening, when I changed my name to gem, I invited my closest people and my closest family members to like a zoom ceremony. And it was, I think I invite, I made it for like two and a half hours. Is that, it was long. I invited like a long invitation and I was like, everybody I love, please come. And, uh, I asked people to share a story of my prior life with my prior name, my same life with my prior name, actually, because I wanted to be able to thread through like who I was and who I was becoming and feel like the cohesion. <clears throat> And people just shared so much love that I actually tapped out, I would say maybe like oh, 60 to 80% of the way through. Yeah. And I I was basically dissociated. I was like um, shaking and shivering all over, like from head to toe. My teeth were chattering. Um, every muscle was tense. Uh, I was, my, I was breathing, but it felt almost like I was just breathing nitrogen, like, or, or, or like pure oxygen or something. Wow. Maybe it was like the feeling of pure oxygen, but it's too much at some point. And, uh, yeah, I felt really, really sad and regretful in some ways because like, I couldn't, I could not physiologically manifest presence for that amount of love coming at me. And from my closest people. And it was such a good learning lesson of like, there's a major pleasure ceiling. There's a major receiving ceiling. Cause like Julia, even afterwards was like, if that is the most you can take, she said this. And I felt it was honestly so intense for her to even say that at that time. But she was like, you can take so much more than this, like so much more love than this is destined for you. And I was literally like going to throw up. I'm like getting nauseous just thinking about it. And so then my like thing for the next few months after that became exploring 
Where are my pleasure limits and how can I gently massage them? And it's not about blasting them through. And I think what a lot of people do when they're exploring their pleasure limits is they take drugs or they go to Burning Man or they do some kind of peak experience that like it does blast, it forces them past their pleasure limits. Yeah. But there's always going to be a, like a balance to pushing our body into situations that it's not ready for. Right. Like we're going to, we're going to get some kind of payback for that. Like you're still getting activated, but you just can't feel it. And so there's going to be a hangover, basically a hangover, an emotional hangover. Right. A hangover. And yeah, I wish people knew more like that. It's valid to want to stretch those things. And actually, if we do just sit back and don't let ourselves expand our capacity to receive, we'll probably stay the same in our business. We'll probably stay the same in our finances, will probably stay the same in our relationships and in so many other things, because even our health in some ways is a process of receiving. And like we, yeah, it's all a metaphor for the other. It's all just forms of energy. And like, I think we should be working on or not should, but I'm very much consciously currently working on expanding that, but not expanding it in a way that is um, violating towards the very real basic capacity that we have but I am growing it I'm growing it so inspiring yeah I yesterday was one of my big moments I think and it's so weird because it wasn't a huge moment it wasn't but I I made the connection between me feeling manic and when for me, a lot of these things happen when the flow is like really strong. It's like synchronicities within minutes of each other. It's like, bam, 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 bam. It's like, maybe I've gone through two hours and I've hit like 15 synchronicities that are just like blaringly. Then I start to feel it's, yeah, it's, it turns into non-pleasure. It turns into it turns into overstimulation. I'm overstimulated Mm -hmm. by my connection with with myself and its other mirror forms. <laughs> I'm overstimulated by my gratitude. I'm overstimulated by just the fact that I'm existing. <laughs> I'm overstimulated by all of it. And that's oh. why for me, my sensory area with my hammock, I have a hammock. I should post this like with this episode, but I have a hammock and then I have like a a skylight on my ceiling that like spins and it has like stars and like nebula type shapes and different forms of life. And it spins extremely slowly. And I lay in the hammock and I swing and rock and bounce and stim. And I like, I literally like, uh, like in the hammock. And then sometimes I just lay there. Sometimes I fall asleep there, but like going in there and just looking at the lights is essential to my well being. Like, thank you to the autistic geniuses who posted about their sensory areas online so that I could find them, see them, and then copy them. We need digestion spaces. Digestion. I'm actually dealing with digestion with inside my body right now, but I also just wanted to take a tea to Jen's um, safe space. Yeah, it is. That is my dream. I can't right now because my ceiling will actually collapse. I live in an old, old home, but it is my when I move out of this apartment, that is the first thing I do in my new meditation space. I put a hammock and I put a nebulizer, like color, color thing up there. I also ran into this very sweet woman when I took Barrett to the Lincoln Park Conservatory. Barrett is a little baby that I nanny. And she, um, she showed me socks. They're called autism socks. And it's like this, it's, actually, I'll show you this picture right now. Show me. Um, <laughs> so cute. Because socks are the worst. Um, it's a full body sock. Sorry, this is just taking me one second. Cause... Sounds sexual. So this, she used to work with, um, and like a practice with a lot of autistic kids and they would use these when they were having meltdowns. That looks amazing. <laughs> That looks amazing. It looks great. I want it. Yeah, it comes from oh, me too. So fun to be like moving, but feeling that resistance. I gotta get one. I gotta get one. 
I deserve yeah. it. I deserve it. Actually, Gabby left something here that I don't know what it is. You just can walk around your apartment and say, I am receiving, I am receiving, I'm receiving, and then you'll find it. You know the one thing I will never receive, though, and I've literally just given up on it? Those Cocoa Pebbles. <laughs> Those Cocoa Pebbles. Oh, they must have gotten left at the grocery store somehow. They had to. Those Cocoa Pebbles. Shantaba be received. <laughs> They're unreceivable. Something? Oh, my God, but... Something. Yeah. But yeah, this is like the, um, I kind of had a celebratory therapy session this morning where I was like, you know, in a good way and feeling great and grateful. And, um, then I had like a bit of a celebratory conversation with my friend after poll. And then I had planned that we were going to have this podcast and talk about celebration. And like, I really wanted to come in hot and be like, let's brag. I want to brag. And I actually felt myself already coming into this conversation, having reached something of a pleasure edge for the day where like it, it it's edgy and hard for me actually to like hold this for you, with you right now and celebrate myself, even though there's also a part of me that really wants to do it because I did have a good therapy session where I was celebrated. And it's like, wow, that's the cap. Like, wow. it's just so interesting. Well, I think there's also something to be said for balance here too, right? Like you've already expressed these things. Sometimes there's not a need for you to express them more. You felt like you've, you've done your brags. I think there's something to be said for authentically expressing what you're feeling in the moment too. Because I don't yeah. think at this moment, I don't, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I don't think you would feel like uncomfortable if we were to go into an area of that, but it's not what's authentically happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're kind of digging into something else. Because mm -hmm. I feel like we could sit here, we did even brag a little bit earlier. I feel like if I were to say, I don't know, how does this make you feel? Jem, your business is doing amazing. You already have a client that comes back consistently that worships you and is obsessed with you. How does that make you feel? I feel good. I feel good. There's no problem. <laughs> I feel good. <sighs> oh, should I read the cards that I drew for us? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I want to say one last thing on the topic just before we switch and before I get a little bit high. When I reached this mm -hmm. manic cap yesterday, mm -hmm. so I was going into my friend's house, the guy that I'm dating, and I was, I was manic. <laughs> I was in a manic state. <laughs> I knew that entering, and um, I got in the house, and I went... <laughs> Like, and um, he had had a really long day. He had been in like rehearsals, and they didn't go super easily. And um, it was just, I found myself because I knew I was manic. I felt like I was testing the relationship. I felt like I'm in such a state that if I show up this way, and you see me this way. Like, it's a test of our relationship. But this person is also a really safe space. And when I did show up and I was that way, it, it wasn't a test of the relationship. That's old, like, patternistic things. That was, like, that was kind of, like, a level up for me to an experiencing pleasure. It's, like, I can just be. We both know I'm ungrounded right now. This is a fact. Like, we're doing what we can to help me get better, but we're not judging me. And that's such a space that I have not received in a long time in like an intimate mm -hmm. relationship. I just didn't have to worry about it. I really was worried walking into the house. Like, wow, I can't believe I'm showing up this way. But it was so easy to just be like, oh my God, <laughs> there's a little squirrel that just popped up. <laughs> And I did the exact same thing. 
Okay, because, you know, I didn't want to interrupt. I really didn't want to, but I have found not one, <laughs> not two, but three new objects under my butt. <laughs> Just while you were talking, I found three objects. <laughs> what the fuck? Why? <laughs> I'm so disturbed. Oh my god. Oh, I'm I'm not you're disturbed. I'm enamored. I'm enamored <laughs> by the powers that your ass holds. <sighs> oh my god. Inspired. Um, but I wanted to say something about what you're saying about, um, yeah. Okay. It was one of the most life-changing moments of my entire life. I got a shout out Garrett Thurston. I'm happy to name him by name because like, this is a positive thing. Changed my life forever. And one of the most memorable moments I was in, um, (laughs) I was in his apartment because my girlfriend at the time lived there. They were housemates and I was just complaining about like, oh, I met this boy and uh, immediately started showing him like all of me, like everything, everything, everything. And I was like being really down on myself. This is a pattern for me. Like, and I'm I'm not going to lie. One of our mutual friends actually is the person who like told me for the first time, they were like, you are, you are showing too much of yourself when you meet boys. I was young. I remember and it's all a, this so yeah. I'm so glad you're bringing this up. Yeah, you're unconsciously pushing them away. And I was just like, whoa, because I didn't, I was trying to welcome them in. And so this was the deeply implanted seed that had taken root in my soul and was choking out my nutrients inside. And so I'm just telling this like it's a fact, like it's truth. I'm like, yeah. And I, I always just like scare boys away because I'm like showing too much of myself. And it's like my weird thing. And he interrupted me and just, he said two words. He just, he was rolling his joint and he said, how generous. And I literally didn't register it. I actually kept talking. And then I did one of those like, like rewind the tape moments where I had to pause and be like, what did he just say? And then I kind of pushed back against it. I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. Cause like, I'm like, just did it. I'm too much. And he just went, how generous. And he said it a few times in this really slow and steady way until I was like, oh, Uh uh-huh. There is no part of us. There's no way of us that's not a gift. The most authentic version of us in any moment is the most gift worthy version. Like this has also been such a light bulb for me in my healing journey is like, there's no, there's no one I could pretend to be who is in any way more sexy, more attractive, more magnetic, more wonderful, or more healing to the world than who I really truly am. Who I actually am, my honest self is always going to be the best. Yes. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's hard for me to to feel this way because you know me. I'm I am a kind of person that usually if something enters my life that's a problem, I like to go into the corner and work on it until it's done and then come back and um address the situation. But sometimes Sometimes I go, I like the fact that I'm able to go into the corner and deal with things on my own. And I think there's a time and place for that. But sometimes things are just ready to come through. And there have been times where I've gone to the corner where it would have been much more in my power and much more beneficial for everyone in the situation if I would have just said it in the moment. And yeah, maybe it would have come out with a little bit of anger or a little bit of whatever. I am at a point where I can trust myself to have healthy, constructive conversations that aren't just like based off pure emotion. They're logical. I'm able to take emotion out of it and look at the situation from different perspectives. So what you're saying, that authenticity is when you're being yourself, it even accounts for those really crappy moments, those moments where you need to cry, those moments where you need to like be witnessed in the mess that you're experiencing. Like the people that love you, they're going to be there for it. They're not I mean, it's the greatest thing ever. Go anywhere. They're not going to judge you. 
it's the greatest gift ever. Like when, when my birth clients gift me with their vulnerability, I feel infinitely blessed. I literally feel like cups and, and, and like, and, and what do I, what would I like? It's like, yeah, the images and, um, I think, uh, I think it's um, the sixth Harry Potter book. I think it's Half Blood Prince, where he goes to Gringotts. Uh, Gringotts. <laughs> he goes to Gringotts to get Gringotts. He goes over to the Gringotts. I feel like Gringot. I feel like this is good, probably called a Gringot. <laughs> My butt was That's hiding Gringot. Your butt, a Gringot. <laughs> that was a Gringot. So he goes the to oh, Gringot. It's a municipal Gringot. <laughs> it is. It is. You know, he goes because he's trying to find the goblet and then it's like, it's cursed so that it like is really hot in his hand and is burning his hand. But it also causes like a bunch of these other goblets to like explode out of it. And so it's like a raining avalanche of gold. It's like the most riches, like magnet, like abundant, 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 abundant. Like that's what I feel. I didn't read that book or see that movie. So I'm just going along. I don't actually understand. (laughs) This is for the fans out there. This is for the Harry Potter fans. (laughs) <laughs> this is for the audience <laughs> um but yeah they uh when they show me their vulnerability that's the exact image that comes to mind of what kind of energy I'm receiving from them when they're crying when they're vomiting when they're pissing on themselves when they're shitting and letting me ho- like you know wipe the shit like when they're shitting emotionally yeah. and I'm helping them wipe the shit emotionally like That I I literally, it's like the most riches. It is the most riches. It is like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the honor. It's healing to be around authenticity. Oh, I, sometimes I, I travel the border between what is good to show what, how much space is good space to take up. And like, that's, that's the edge that I deal with when I deal with authenticity. Like, basically, that's what it comes down to. Am I taking up too much space? And this is something that you and I talk about a lot, a lot, a lot. And there's, it kind of falls in line a little bit with like reputation. If you're showing all your wobbles and allowing them to be out there, it leaves space for... You know, you're not, a lot of what we're taught in society is represent your best self, show your best self, the Instagram Mm -hmm. society, Mm -hmm. and it will no doubt be taken in some ways if you're being completely authentic and taking up space, but is that bad? I think there's an awareness that has to be held. But I don't know. What do you think? Do you fall into that like edge and boundary too? Because th- that's where I find myself dealing with my hardship of being authentic. I don't want to take up too much space. This is what I feel like you and I are challenging in a safe context with each other through the pleasure container. This is like our central thing is like basically visibility fears and what we deal with around visibility, I think is the challenge of taking up space. And I feel that because we both were socialized as females and in like polite, good girl culture, we're, we could always stand to take up more space. I definitely think for me right now, and if this resonates, it resonates, if it doesn't throw it out, but for me right now, absolutely elbowing, leaning, tumbling, somersaulting, cartwheeling into taking up more space, more space, more space, more space, more space. And it's never going to stop being uncomfortable because every time I get comfortable at a new level, I'm going to have to then level up. But that's why I'm doing it with you. That's why I wanted to do it with you because we can hold each other through it. And we can find ourselves at new levels and celebrate how far we've come and like really like pop champagne and enjoy it along the way and like really get that it's a journey and that there's always farther to go. But I think the direction is towards, <laughs> decidedly towards taking the space up. Saj, I think you're right. One of the reasons that I've stayed with this nanny family that I'm with for so long 
is because of the complete vulnerability. I can show up like, we talk about everything. We make sex jokes with each other. Sam comes out and she's like, feel my boob. And like, <laughs> we made, like everything is so authentic. That is the reason. You're so right. Yeah. Sometimes the space is a lot. And and it's like, wow, I can't believe we're doing this. Like, I, this, this is a lot. Like, <laughs> we're all taking up a lot of space. I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you so much for listening. Please like and subscribe. If you want to stay in touch with Jem, subscribe to my email list on rainbowdoulaberlin.com. That's rainbow, D-O-U-L-A, berlin.com. And follow me on Instagram at gem underscore rainbow underscore healing. To stay in touch with Jess, please go to roottwinkle.com. That's R-O-O-T-W-I-N-K-L-E.com.